I'll move now to stage three. <coughs> Assuming we survive stage two, <laughs> so <laughs> we will move to stage three. Now, whoever goes through stage two, now he will reap the benefits. Because stage three, I have news for you, it's actually easier. Believe it or not, it's easier. If the maintenance is there, and the, and the history is there, and everything is there, stage three is easier. A lot of these things would you ask, which right now for you are very difficult, if you are in stage three, they're actually easier. So, what is stage three? Stage three is a combination of basically three activities. That being non-revenue management, distribution of revenue management, rehabilitation maintenance, and infrastructure planning. Shortly I will explain what are these three things. Of course, each one of these items is supported by items module. <coughs> so there is a specific module addressing non-revenue water and addressing asset management and distribution management. What is distribution management? Distribution management, as you see in the slide, we want to ensure proper service delivery to operate and control our pumping costs and to localize and quantify as much as we can system losses. Now, as you can see, there are preconditions. To get there, you need to have a computerized billing system, which everybody has. You need to have a good asset registry, and you need to have a distribution network reasonably zoned with bulk meters. So, we're going back to zoning now. I don't know which of you were in the advanced training. You remember we touched the subject of zoning. When we touched the subject of zoning, a lot of people didn't exactly follow what we were doing on the zoning side. We understand. The concept is not that simple. It's deceptively simple. It's not. There is confusion about zoning. Different people mean different things. People do DMA zones and they think they do zoning. They're not. DMA zoning is artificial zoning we create to control losses, but it's not our true zoning. Our true zoning and how the system behaves is controlled by pressures, by PRVs, by reservoirs. That doesn't mean it coincides with our DMA zone. It might, might not. And that creates a lot of confusion. <coughs> because you have consultants coming in and telling you, now ah, break the system, yes, fine. Put bulk meter here, put bulk meter there, put 20 bulk meters. In the meantime, they're destroying the network. They're destroying the pressures. And then one brings the other. They say, oh, you know, there's no pressure here. Oh, there's too much pressure here. Put another PRV. So you start creating a very high complexity within the system because you, the whole process was wrong. Because simple concept, theoretical simple concept, is not understood. So, we have to go back to basics. We have an excellent tool, the zone manager. Excellent tool. That tool, what it does, ignores what you have done. Ignores completely what you have done. It tries by itself, unsuccessfully sometimes, but it tries by itself to recreate your zoning. It says, I don't care what you've done, I don't care what you think, I'll tell you what your zoning is. And if your data are correct, will recreate by itself your zoning. And that is your true zone. Your true DMA is your true pressure zone. We're going to come back to it. As I said, it sounds simple, it's not that simple. But from our understanding, it has to do everything <coughs> with distribution management. All the changes. So, what are we addressing here? We have a very nice infrastructure that we call it non-revenue auditing and balance. It's a separate subsystem with a specific purpose to manage DMAs. If we have built our asset registry properly, 
now we could be putting in the infrastructure to actually capture and control our DMAs. But before we get there, as you can see, these are the modules that come with it. There is a separate module for zone management, for commercial data evaluation, and for an account for water analysis. I will say a few things about commercial data evaluation because this is a more complicated thing. But the unaccounted for analysis module and on revenue is the heart of the system. Part of it is what we call supply analysis and zoning. Zoning, some of you have seen, your whole system must be regenerated by the system. To start discussing distribution management, we must see, have the same picture in the system with the one you have on your walls. We must be able to see and understand the zoning the way you understand it. If we have a disagreement, there is a problem. Either what is in the system is wrong and you are right, or you are wrong and the system is right. Can be both. So, the starting point is the zoning. At that beginning of stage three, we must have all of us the same understanding that these are your zones. If we don't, there is a problem. Okay, I won't get saying more into it. And then we can relate if we have the layer with your connections and the demands from your billing. We can relate for each of these DMA zones, your connections, your consumers to the actual network. The system will do that automatically. And what the system will do will aggregate the demands for the whole zone but also we'll do something else. We'll do what we call supply analysis. Now, for utilities that have a few bulk meters, that's not a big issue. If you have two, three bulk meters, it's fine. You manage them. But the problem is, you, with time, you start putting in the system more and more and more bulk meters. The three become 10, they become 15, they become 20. And how do you manage these bulk meters? You say, I'll put telemetry. Excellent. So now you have 20 bulk meters and you have a very nice telemetry system. And now you have all these signals and all these records coming from the telemetry with interruptions, with readings wrong, with wrong flows, with spikes. How do you use this data? How do you get from the telemetry readings to balance your DMA zone? That is the, the question addressed by a module called supply analysis. We also didn't know. We found from real practice. We went again and began to utilities and they told us, look, we have this problem. We spend a lot of money putting in telemetry, but we're not getting what we want out of it. It's not what we're supposed to get. How we use that data? How do we relate this data from the delivery to our DMA zones? So that infrastructure is in, and the process is called supply analysis. So we bring the data in from the telemetry. We link to the telemetry. Since it was asked, we're going to explain you how you're going to link in the telemetry. If you have a reasonable humanoid recent telemetry system that we can actually link and is not ancient that works in proprietary database we should be able to link it's easy it's not so difficult it should be a straight database so we bring in we establish a link and we start bringing in these telemetry records and filter them and analyze them and what do we do before i go here let me go up again What do we do? We link them to the bulk meters. So we take each telemetry records, we link them to the bulk meters, and we group them. Because our zone manager knows which bulk meters belong to which zone. So it doesn't matter if you have three bulk meters in one DNA zone. The readings will be grouped automatically. That's called supply analysis. Because where I want to end up, is with one inflow going into the zone. What is our 
final objective? I'm not going to say now the theory here, but what is our final objective? This, everything we do follows IWA practices. The system has incorporated fully IWA leakage control practices. IWA discusses and propagates active leakage control. We want to be able to react as soon as possible from leakage incidents and prioritize the zones and prioritize the problems. So, the system, once it's set up, automates the process. Here is your DMAs. It picks up, recreates the night flows. It, it generates for every uh, zone the actual night flow and prioritize. And even you can have alarms and, and tell you that something is going wrong in DMA 11. So automatically, every day can give you this kind of alarms in which zones you have problems. And it does a few fancy stuff, like the graph you see here. This is MNF trend. Whoever have worked with this kind of analysis on non-revenue water, what do you want to see? You want to see the minimum night flow, and you want to see the trend of the minimum night flow. You want to see where it's going. If, if the minimum night flow is going up, you have a problem. That zone is problematic. You have, you have a major leakage going up. So that kind of analysis the system does from the telemetry records and the supply analysis. That means active leakage control. But we can also follow the top-down approach. What I just showed you briefly is the bottom-up approach. We can go top-down approach. Top-down approach means we balance the supply with the billing records, with the grouping. And again, we can see for longer periods, for a week, month, year, what is the actual balancing for the utility of all each of the zones. And we can produce, again, different types of graphs for any kind of period. This session is accompanied by a training. Training for understanding how we link to telemetry, how we analyze bulk metering, and how we do balancing top-down and bottom-up based on IWA practices. The full best practices of IWA is incorporated in the system. Everything we do doesn't stop, doesn't negate any other activities from the revenue water you're having, because we're following the same rules. In fact, if you already have other activities for leakage control or unaccounted for water or other organizations providing you support for these activities, this fits excellent because we follow best practices. So that closes the subject and the introduction to non-revenue because we will start discussing more about non-revenue we will stay here till tonight. So this was a very small introduction. I'll move to the next issue which is rehabilitation planning. Some people say <coughs> rehabilitation planning is the heart of asset management. If you go in the books, in the bibliography, this is true asset management. I got the question, when are we going to do real asset management? Well, this is real asset management. I mean, in terms of asset management practice, rehabilitation planning is the real asset management. Uh, if you Google it in the internet, that's what you're going to get. So, in stage three, we are addressing rehabilitation planning, which is the real asset management, as people say. That includes three parts. Condition assessment, financial asset valuation, it was mentioned earlier, uh, amortization, as it was called, and risk assessment, because at the heart of asset management is the risk assessment. You have to address risk, risk of breakdown. What is the actual risk? And the purpose are pretty obvious. We want to minimize the cost of ownership, minimize the risk of failure, improve the level of service, and sustain the infrastructure in working condition. There are a few concepts that from now on you will see again and again appearing in the system. One concept is the condition categories. 
the part of the best practices in the system. You will see it this year from the maintenance. When a foreman goes out and inspects whatever, he'll be forced to categorize the asset according to these categories. Not a common there, whatever he feels like. He has to classify in one of these. Each one relates to an actual meaning, but he has to classify the condition according to standard categories. And then there are other principles like the deterioration curves. Because if we know the condition of the asset, we can relate the condition of the asset to the percentage remaining useful life. It's like you, you have a car and you take it to a, a service and they tell you it's in a bad condition. You expect it to have another 10 years, it has another 2 years. It's exactly the same principle. So you relate percentage useful life to the actual condition of the asset. And where we want to move it is to understand this kind of a matrix. Because this kind of a matrix will determine the kind of maintenance we're going to make. Because when we want to move the utility, at least for the important assets, and for those that we know the condition, to do reliability center maintenance. So we want to move the utility to define and have priority lists and classify their assets in terms of risk assessment and priorities to be able to assess the to be able to schedule their actual maintenance. So just quickly to explain this matrix. If an asset is not important and we didn't know the condition, then we do nothing. We just let it break down. And when it breaks, we fix it or we throw it away. If an asset is important, and, but we don't know its condition, a car, then we normally do time-based maintenance. So we say every 5,000 kilometers we must bring it for service. That's time-based maintenance. If an asset is not important, but we know its condition, then we do condition-based assessment. You, you, know, you have a pump. It's not important, but it knows its condition. You know it's going to break. So, based on its condition, you go and fix it. But the main block is the last one, because if an asset is important and we know this condition, then we must put it on a priority list because it's an important asset. That must go for rehabilitation and must be prioritized according to the risk of breaking down. That's the logic we're building from next year. How do we actually prioritize maintenance? That's called rehabilitation planning. And that is a big issue in asset management because of affects budgets. That's your budget for rehabilitation. That's what you're negotiating with the municipalities. That's what you're going and asking money for. How are you going to convince them? You need to be able to assess risk. <coughs> and then comes the concept of importance. Importance means What's the consequence of failure of this asset? How important is for you this pump station? That's the importance. And we assess importance in terms of three impacts. How much is it going to cost the utility if it breaks down? What it means in terms of continuity of supply? What will happen if this pipeline breaks down? How long will be the whole town left without water? And what the quality? If there is pollution, or if that, if that thing breaks down and creates pollution, a chlorinator or whatever, what does it mean to us? So, you might have noticed, I got the question from a few gentlemen or ladies. They were actually asking me, why in every asset they open there is a little box there asking for the importance of the asset? That is why. That is why. Because we want you to, uh, to, to mark and we want you to look at the importance of every single asset, particularly system components, particularly assets, which are very, very important. Where we end up, we end up here, to a matrix that relates the importance to the condition of the asset. And that's called risk assessment. 
So this is a decision matrix that relates the important and the condition. So if it's extreme important and it's in a poor condition, that's high priority. This is medium priority, this is no pri lower and no priority. That's the methodology we want to introduce and we want to train you with a specific module called rehabilitation planning and a specific procedure and methodology how you should do rehabilitation planning. How should you prioritize your assets for maintenance for or upgrade? So, again, different activities, different modules. We're building it up, condition assessment methodology, financial evaluation, rehabilitation planning. I won't say more into that. But uh, that's a typical output from the system. Filling in the boxes with the different elements, the different assets that need to be prioritized and what will going to be the cost for each one of them. <coughs> training, again a training session, specifically for rehabilitation planning, where we're going to address all this methodology, we're going to address risk assessment, we're going to address how you build decision matrix, you're going to build by yourself decision templates, you're going to prioritize by yourself your assets, and you, this is the practice you will start to implement, hopefully, in your utilities thereafter. And we complete the main elements with infrastructure planning. There's too many things we try to put together, but unfortunately, there were all of them asked in your questions. So there's nothing to be left out. <laughs> so, infrastructure planning, involves a lot of activities. Involves emergency plan, involves master plan. We're going to focus in one type of infrastructure planning, the quick win. This is the upgrading plan. We want to answer the question, okay, I understand that it would be nice to have a few millions to upgrade the whole system and fix the system, but I don't. What do I do now? What can I do to fix the system with a minimum cost, what can I do to optimize the performance of the system? So, the main output of the upgrading plan is what you see here. To fix the system involves rezoning. You can't fix the system without rezoning it. That's a, a very, very important concept. You have to understand your existing zoning. You have to understand what goes wrong with your existing zoning and then say, fine, now I'm going to rezone it. I'm going to change the way the system operates. And, of course, if you do that, we'll have impact in everything. We'll have impact in leakage, we'll have impact in electricity, and of course will be the correct basis if you ever want to do maintenance, if you want to do master planning. So, Upgrading of the plan, upgrading of a network is an important exercise. Of course, we're not going to do the upgrading plans for all of you. We're going to teach you and give you examples of how it's done. But the methodology is the important part. And the training courses will include evaluating an existing network and then a proposed network, what's the optimization methodology, how the rezoning should be done, and how the pipe work should be reconnected. This is an example of a network. The first trick we do in a network is we forget the zoning. And we say, all right, let's see what will happen in the system. The tool here is hydraulic analysis. This is the place for hydraulic analysis. To do what we're discussing now, you have to do hydraulic analysis. So now you look at the network and you say, right, without zoning, what will happen? Ah, these are the pressures of peak conditions. This is what's happening. Let's look what I have now for zoning. What exactly happens to the system? Let's see why it works, why the pressures drop. And then you come up with a different rewiring and you say, no, we're going to break the system differently. We're going to change the way the system is wired. We're going to change the way the system is connected. We're going to take these 10 PRVs out, we're going to reconnect these 10 pipes, we're going to do this, do that. Small interventions in the actual system to normalize pressures and normalize flows because things go out of hand. 
and system doesn't work as it should work. That what is upgrading plan. Now, why is it critical? It is critical, first of all, you understand all of you why is it critical, but it's critical for another reason that is not that obvious. People jump into non-revenue water and distribution management and try to find losses without optimizing first the system. To make it more very simple, if you have a zone with very high pressures, first you have to sort out the pressures before you look for losses. You have to normalize pressures first before you address the problem of leakage. So be very weary if you, if you see consultants, if you see people trigger happy. I call trigger happy people to go out and start digging. There are a lot of trigger happy people. They love going out and destroying half the city, doing all sorts of things with very little result. Very little result. Or result for six months and one, two years later, the losses go up again. That's why the losses problem is not that simple. It requires understanding first of your zoning and then how to rewire your zoning, how to change your zoning before you address leakage. I say it again and again. And practice has shown that even from major organizations, major funding organizations, simple principles like that are not understood. And of course there will be a few more subjects, two more subjects that are they're going to be mentioned and, and uh, trained in the, during the presentations that for completeness of stage three, we thought it's important to include. We understand that three things I mentioned earlier are the most important, but these two are also important. The one is quality of water. How do you manage the quality of water? Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, this is a problem very often ignored by managers. They think quality is a problem of the laboratory. They undermine quality, and uh, when there is a crisis and things go wrong, then you really have a problem and you see your face in the newspapers because there is a problem with quality of water. Quality can become, in certain utilities, a major problem. So we're going to discuss quality of water, what you should do in terms of quality, in terms of managing different parameters, in terms of standards and so on. We're going to show you examples how different utilities managing their sampling points and how they manage the records in the laboratories and so on. This is just an introduction to water quality practice. We're going to show you how it's being done in other places in Europe, what's the European standards for water quality, how water quality should be addressed. And then, and last but not least, we're going to present you what is commercial data evaluation. Now, one thing we don't do, because I got this question, we will not link directly to your billing system. Not because we cannot, but because every billing system is individually different. So uh, this is a cloud operation more or less standardized. It's easy to link to a telemetry database, but you have 70 different billing systems. Each one written by a different person with different tables, with different so on. What we can do is bring in some minimum records with consumption from your billing system that you provide us. But to do a live link with the billing system is something we can do further after if you require us. We can actually do it, it's not a problem, we do it all the time. And together with that, we're doing something very, very important called commercial data evaluation. Because since we're speaking about non-revenue water, non-revenue water has two aspects, it has the leakage and it has your commercial losses. Now, Whichever utility has more losses than 50%, I guarantee you, at least 40% of them are commercial losses. So by chasing leakage, you're chasing half the equation. The other half is your commercial losses. So you have to address commercial losses one way or the other. So to do that, of course, is not enough what we're going to do. You need to go into the building. Because sometimes the billing itself is a problem. You have to understand how they bill, what they do, it, how they read. And we're going to show you some results of such analysis. And typical outputs you should expect. 
in order to do a billing data evaluation. In terms of customer blowing problems, metering problems, you need to classify customers as paying and not paying, something very much ignored. Somebody who is not paying consumes more water because he doesn't care. That is in principle very much forgotten. There are places, I was discussing in, in one, I think in, in Albania, I think, there, are, there are some places where the water losses is some utilities, like non-revenue water, the 60 and 70 percent because of so many illegal connections. Illegal connections, people getting water for free. The penalty you have because for every single illegal connection is unbelievable. Because it's not only he, the, the illegal connection doesn't consume the average consumption of a normal consumer. It might consume double, triple. Because he doesn't care. He's not in the system. He's nowhere to be found. So you need a whole different exercise just to address this part of the commercial losses. So, and the different outputs coming from some commercial data analysis. Now, our effort is to sensitize you to the problem, to explain you what needs to be done and what is required. As I explained, we can't link to every billing system. If you ask us individually, we can do it, but not as part of the CM program because it's very difficult of the different standards you have. So, Canada. As we said, we meet here February 2019, all of us, for training. So, that will be the first training at the, towards the end of February. Then we come again in May. Then we come again in September. And then we do the fourth training course in November. The third year is very intensive. It has four training courses instead of two, and they're quite intensive training courses. Because now we're capitalizing in everything we've done in stage one and stage two. And that in a nutshell concludes the whole program. I would like to say something, last one. We don't see that as the end of the story. This for us is not a three-year project. It is for GIZ, it is not for us. It might not be for GIZ either. <laughs> but from our side, it's not a three-year project. We see this as a long-term relation with yourselves. We see that, that we're going to be your partners for a very long time. That's what we want to achieve. We want you to trust us, to build that relation and trust over the next three years, to see that you're getting results out, to see what you can do and actually use our systems and use also the services of the hubs because the hubs are the most important aspect of this equation to support you and improve the whole infrastructure. Thank you. <laughs>